Welcome to uh, our First Unitarian Church of Honolulu's Kauhana here at, uh, at our little, uh, our little um, online platform. This is a time when we gather together to kind of enjoy ourselves and have a little more relaxed uh, environment than Sundays and other things like that. Although many of my colleagues would argue I'm a little too relaxed on Sundays myself. So, uh, but that's uh, neither here nor there. So today is the time to, uh, what we're going to do in common sort of contemporary parlance is called uh, an AMA, an Ask Me Anything. So when someone's hosting an AMA on say like Reddit or on one of these sites, uh, they call it like, I'm a electrical engineer for Apple, AMA, like ask me anything and we'll answer all these questions. So, uh, so that's what this is today. You can ask me anything, it doesn't mean I'm gonna answer everything, although I usually do, uh, but I'll promise to tell you if it's something that I don't wanna answer. Now, you don't have to ask your question out loud. We don't have any rules really here. You can send me a direct message um, unfortunately, there's no way to send it anonymously. Uh, so if you mm -hmm. want to ask, maybe ask one of your friends to ask it if you don't want to ask me uh, in, the, <laughs> in the direct messaging. Uh, so however you want to work it. Um, but that's the plan. We may have a guest uh, visiting in a little bit. Um, one Stuart, who's going to be dropping by to deliver something um, for, for very important stuff. And uh, we do have a a friend of mine from uh, from Divinity School is sitting on the couch here also. So if I say anything that isn't true, Sean will you'll hear a loud a loud yelling and beating me about the head to Absolutely. be to be honest. So uh, yeah, so we're in good shape. You've got all the help you need to make sure you hear what you want to hear. And uh, yeah, so we're off and running on on uh, on this. I'll, some people emailed me questions. So we're gonna start with those to warm everyone up. Uh, the first question is, what is most fulfilling, satisfying about being a minister? Uh, I'll, read, I'll read part B uh, in a second. Um, what is the most fulfilling, satisfying about being a minister? For me, I think it's, I have to say it's two things and it, it's probably, um, you know, it's probably, there are two different areas. I'd say having a worship service just kind of come together and work and lock in and just kind of change me and others is probably one of the most satisfying things for me. Uh, but then maybe one of the most fulfilling things, I think, you know, we had a new member welcome ceremony like two, two times ago, or no, maybe the last one. And every single person in the ceremony was already doing something at the church, like was involved in some way. And I feel like that is very satisfying as a minister in our co-ministry. Cause like, it's not just me doing the minister show. It's like, how are we working together and feeling that, like the groups coming together to involve people and that bringing people in as members, that is, when I, that is like a healthy system working. And I think that was a very uh, satisfying feeling. So maybe fulfilling and satisfying, uh, you know, are those are probably the two things that come to mind. Um, and then part B of this question is, what is the least fulfilling, satisfying? Uh, that's a tricky one. I gotta say, I trotted, I trotted one answer uh, out about to this out in my brain, and. Uh, you know, I do a lot of administrative work. It ranges everywhere from, uh, I don't think it's been below 20% of my time in, in years. And it's been as much as 35 to 40% some months of my time. And it's not that it's unsatisfying. There are, I actually, you know, I'm a nerd. Like I, I kind of like administration. Sometimes I think, you know, I would have just been a really good personal assistant if I didn't if I wasn't a minister, like just planning other people's lives, just get off on it. Um, but uh, I think when I see aspects, and I, I say this with all love to my, to my people, when I see aspects of my administrative time that I wish congregants were doing, uh, that's when I feel like there's er those are the areas I know I need to work on as a minister to get people more excited about, say, membership and things like that. So uh, 
I'd say that's one of the areas is where I feel like when I feel like I'm kind of maybe letting you down or letting myself down a little bit by like over functioning somewhere um, that, that you would enjoy, I think, and that I haven't quite found a way to make it enjoyable enough for someone else to be doing. So I think that's, that's probably, if that makes sense, that's, that's kind of it. Because as, as folks, if you know, I, I look pretty carefully at how I'm spending my time every month. And so I can speak pretty, yeah, pretty sure. apparently that that's one of the things. Right. So, but the other thing I want to say as a coda to that is that everyone, there are people on this call who are doing 10 things at the church. So I, I say that with like all love for the people that are doing many things already, that it may just be that we don't have enough people to do all the things and so that's why i do some of the things um does that make sense i hope that answers the question um but yeah that's that's the best answer i've got um i have another question here we're, we're doing questions that have been sent to me electronically i'm going to do one more electronic question then i'm going to open the floor for the brave hands of the souls in the room um so I have a question here. Please tell us about your book. Uh, okay. So around July of last year, um, we were all doing nothing. <laughs> you know, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I was home and I had study leave and it coincided with uh, taking a workshop on writing. And I took a workshop on writing and by the end, I had like a basic manuscript because what I've been spending so much of my time doing is listening to friends, to colleagues, to you, to people going through this pandemic who don't know what they want to do now, who like maybe something has happened or they, they've reevaluated their lives or they have different um, priorities now. Or in Honolulu, there's so many people who are under kind of underutilized. They're working two or three jobs just to pay their rent and they're not satisfied by any of them, but they just have to work, work, work. And so the book is called um, uh, Together Again, Reconstructing a Life of Meaning. So it's, it's a set of steps really to follow and exercises to connect better with what our values are and then how to find, uh, connect those values with actions to make meaning in our life. So uh, it's, so that's really the basis is there's like eight sort of activities to do and throughout the, the 10 chapters. And there's some about my own story about changing vocation. So it starts as a book about vocation, then moves through some, some things in the world that make us realize we should be doing or, or that we might enjoy doing more work in the world with others, and then moves through to kind of the big finish. Uh, but that you're going to have to read to, uh, to see. So that is the book. It's being published by Tonic Books out of Portland, Oregon, and uh, it'll be available probably in April. So um, nice. uh, wow. Catherine Graham has her hand up, and then we'll go to another direct question. So I want to know when the book comes out, if you're going to conduct a workshop on it. Yeah, I think I'll probably do a few. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is, the answer is yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, I probably, it would have been nice probably for me to try it out before writing the book, but no one was around and we're all there. And so when I do the second edition, it'll be hilarious because the forward's going to be like, all right, don't do step four, don't do step seven, now do this. And it's actually, you know, it's no longer eight steps, it's five and a half, you know, it's going to be a big revision. Uh, but I'm sure you all have a good attitude about it. So, uh, but I will do a book launch that you'll all be invited to. Uh, I'll also be doing marketing, uh, which would I very much appreciate everyone buying the book on the same day so that it will push it into like a number one spot in some tiny little sliver of a uh, genre. New York Times books. Yeah, so that oh, I can yeah. say I had a number one uh, Amazon seller for an hour uh, one day. <laughs> So that's all the part of the publisher's uh, request. So, um, so we'll see, see or suggestion, but uh, yeah. So that is some of the uh, some of the plan. Wendy, I, Wendy, I played a lot of frisbee on your background when I lived in New York City. 
So, um, but uh, that is my dream location. I my goal when I retire is to move there for a year. So that's a question I have for you. Ah. <laughs> how, how do I make that happen? In <laughs> well, the way things are going, it ain't hard to find a place to live in Manhattan right now. So keep your eye peeled. Oh, yeah? um, almost all my friends moved out of Manhattan in the last year. So why? Uh, they they did not enjoy their experience of being in a worldwide pandemic in one of the most densely populated places of the country. So oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I guess yeah. That makes so, sense. One of them still has not gotten his taste back yet. So, um, mm. oh. yeah, but that's okay. He'll yeah. live. No. Um, it's my dream city. It's it Mecca for, for landscape architects. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Olmstead Park is even more beautiful than Central Park. There's horse paths and yeah. everything. It's beautiful. I, yeah, I didn't get to Prospect Park, but, and I've always said, I, I don't want to live anywhere but Manhattan, but I'm starting to think about Brooklyn. But really, I'm thinking Fifth Avenue. I just got to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I feel you. Uh, good. We have another question in the chat. Um, another part of the ministry question. Aha issue how would you define the idea that every person has a ministry ah this is this is answered better in the sense of uh so here's a funny thing just say not me but say someone is trying to date and they meet uh someone who's from canada or europe and they ask what do you do and you say you're a minister and they're like oh how interesting and they're like and they think you mean you're like a minister of finance or a minister of parliament or a minister of this. because in Europe and Canada, that's what they say. They don't say that. They say priest or, or, or reverend or something. They don't say minister. Uh, and so I sometimes think of well, when everyone has a minister or everyone has a ministry of, of that, that like there are countries that have a minister of everything, you know, and there are aspects of that person's professional life, their vocation how they sort of call out to the world um, that they minister to, you know? And then remember one of the most, you know, when I, when I do the whole section on administration in my monthly report, that's administration. You know, ministrations in a, in a sort of uh, Dickensian uh, way, the ministrations of whatever are just doings, our attention is giving attention. So administration is giving attention to these kinds of things. So ultimately that is what ministry is, is attention. And we live in a world that is, is it's so interesting because in some ways people think of professional ministry as being less and less relevant, but what is the commodity everyone is seeking today? Attention. The mm -hmm. Facebook wants your attention. Instagram wants your attention. They are literally selling your attention so never has ministry, our attention, what we give to people of our time and our love and our care been more valuable uh, in a society than now. So I think that's a long kind of philosophical way to answer that question, but we all have a ministry because we all give attention to things. Um, so that's the way I see it. So, yeah. Any other questions? Nancy Young has a question. Go for it, Nancy. I wonder how you're doing or how the church is doing on getting uh, an RE person and what the plans are because we don't know what's going to happen. It's a great question. Uh, so um, for those of you who don't know, the RE committee, which is the group that more or less makes um, education or learning, learning community decisions here for the church, uh, has decided they want to bring on a a, a coach for the next four months. So since Herdeen, you know, left the position early during the pandemic, there hasn't been much money spent in the DRE, the director of religious education line of the budget. So there's a fair amount of money in there. I think only about 10% of it has been spent 10 or 12%. And so they want to use the remainder over the next four months to bring in a sort of like a master level um, DRE who specializes in transitions and who is like a coach. Um, there's only eight of them in the whole Lareda, which is the 
um, liberal religious educators union or, or group uh, that's affiliated with the Unitarian Universalist Association. There's only eight of them. And this is all they do is help people bridge from one kind of learning ministry uh, to another. And right now, the, our, the co-chairs have identified one of the people that they're most interested in. And we're in discussions with getting in touch with her and figuring out uh, what that would look like over the next four months. And then my comment to the board was, I don't really think it's that valuable to predict too far beyond what this expert has to say. Because part of what we're gonna ask her to do is to really look at our resources, look at what we're doing, then make a recommendation. And my take is to go with that recommendation or to consider that recommendation among uh, others, like the needs of our families and things like that. Um, but that's where we are right now. And so the hope, there's some goal setting that we've done for that position for the coach, for the interim sort of coach, which would be to bring the families together organizationally to set some goals for you know the next few months and then to guide the church through a discernment process about the best uh, and most workable solution for um, our <laughs> That's where we are. The person come here at all? Uh, we haven't. We haven't even spoken to her yet. I haven't. So I don't know all the details. Um, I I I don't. I just don't know. So because uh, it would probably only go for the next. It might go for the next four months. It could go longer. We don't even know that. We just know that. The fiscal year has another four months. So that's uh, as far as we're looking right now. But um, but yeah, that is the that is the plan right now. Callie and Eleanor are on on the case. So um, yeah, and we're gonna be doing a, I'm in the midst of planning a, uh, a family chapel for the young families at a park uh, this month, probably the second Sunday, the 14th at like noon or one, depending on how things are looking, but there's still some planning going for that uh, to be sure. So we're gonna start doing some, some fun stuff like that. But, cool. Yeah, so that's exciting. How about adult RE? Yeah, we have a, uh, Mike, I just today was doing some more work on living in the beloved community, which is a class I'll be teaching. Um, it's probably gonna be five sessions um coming up for me but absolutely the woman who is i mean it's no secret one of the things that has not been going on at the church either is adult re and part of that is was intentional when i was a three-quarter time minister i just told people i'm not going to do that it's just too much to be doing worship and to be also and to try to get that together at three-quarter time it's just not fair and then when i went to full-time in july it was partly because I'm doing about three times the time I used to do on worship right now because of the amount of video and the amount of preparation and the amount of editing and all this kind of stuff that's going on. Um, and so this is really the first time I've gotten my head above water and we're, we have more resources that can help with that. Uh, and people are more used to doing it. So I'm not as involved in worship really over the last few months is the first time. And so now I'm looking toward teaching something myself, but the hope would be that we have a DRE who is going to do both, um, who is going to have uh, that that bandwidth, uh, and with the real hope of training up facilitators for some of these things. I mean, there's amazing uh, pieces out there uh, that the UUA has, and the main key is getting facilitators trained to do it. Uh, even talking about that, though, is where I'm talking like we're a 250 member organization like that's really the size of organization where you begin to have um congregants who are also trained facilitators within an re community uh for adult re at a at about a, you know 93 pledge units and roughly 120 members we're still not we're not really that size congregation as much as i wish that was happening uh, right now we without a dre to set that in motion and get those kind of levels of learning, it's very hard to accomplish that. So that's just kind of the reality of, of where we're at. This church does a ton, a ton with the generosity it so greatly receives from everyone. Um, it, it gets a lot more done than many churches this size with this budget 
Um, but there are some points where we just can't push past without the staff to do it. Um, it's just that, that's just the deal. So, yeah. And that will be part of the discussion. How are we going to fund a, a, a DRE? What does that look like? What does the call process look like? But these are all things I don't want us to worry about right now because that's why we're hiring a professional coach to give us real options, the reality of the situation and, and to help us with that. So, yeah. So that is what is going on. Any other questions? Hmm. Nothing. Nothing. All right. Uh, okay, Allison. That's that's an old uh, pastoral care trick. When no one's talking, you just say, "All right, well, I'm glad you stopped by." Bye, and then everyone says, "Oh, wait, I have a question." <laughs> uh, uh, Allison, go ahead. So, what's the best place to play golf? <laughs> Hawaii. Uh, Where? <laughs> well, if, if you're learning, then Alawai, um, because there is, um, it's wide open. There's almost no water. You, you'll never lose a ball. Um, the problem is it's the busiest golf course in the world. So, you know, they have more, more players and more tee times than any other golf course. So, um, it's not, if you're, other good places for learning is the the par three at there's a, an 18 hole par three called the executive course at Hawaii Kai, and I strongly urge people to to do that for a while. Um, and I don't know, I think the best place I've played golf here is probably in Eva, and at the well, I don't know. I think Royal Hawaiian. I know this is what everyone cares about, but if you've never been to Royal Hawaiian Golf Course, it is, it's a jungle. It's in the middle of the jungle. And you're driving through and there's like these flowers you've never seen. There's birds everywhere. They're so, they're so loud, you can't like, you can't play sometimes. And they're in the way and you just feel like you're in nature playing golf. But you go through like 35 balls because it's such a challenging course. And so in a way it's like, it's it's the most Hawaiian course by far, uh, but it's also the most challenging. There's so much water and dips and turns. And uh, so, I don't know, I'm kind of just rambling here, but uh, to get started, Alawai and the, uh, and the par three at Hawaii Kai, they're also pretty where's, economical. So Where's the Royal Hawaiian course? Royal Hawaiian's right as you come over into Kailua, if you can turn left on the- Right, okay. Left, to go to Kaneohe, instead you turn right and go into that little area. There's a big sign that says Royal Hawaiian Golf Course. Oh, okay. it used to have a different name. Yeah, it used to be called something else. Yes, it used to be called oh. something else. Yeah, yeah. Holly Golf Course is, is pretty easy and city yep. rates. Yeah, Holly, I like Holly a lot. Holly would be definitely a step up from um, from Alawai. The, they really, it's, it's a little over, it can get a little overgrown. Um, but, but yeah, Polly is sort of like Royal Hawaiian light, uh, the Polly golf course. So, <laughs> yeah. So those are, that's what I would say. Um, but get, a, golf, get a, get a Honolulu golf card and everything's like half price. There's like a special card you get and mm -hmm. then you have this number that you just get reservations right on the phone, like the good old fashioned, no internet, no nothing, just using your, your thumbs on your pad and you just get a reservation and you just go and it's super cheap. Uh, I think a round at Alawai with no card is like $16. So, yeah. So, all right. Okay, great. I need to, now all I need to do is take lessons. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do that. I, I've taken a lesson at Golf Tech, uh, which is in, uh, in Kaka'ako. It's, it's pretty intense. Um, I don't know. It was a gift, so I don't know what the prices are, but, um, but it's, uh, that's where a friend of mine takes lessons too. So. Golf tech. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Sounds like Wendy plays a little golf too. You can check in with Wendy. 
So I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I did several boyfriends ago for a few years and then <laughs> he bought a sailboat and that was the end of the golfing. But I loved it. I did. It takes a lot of time and I don't have girlfriends to do it with. So Allison, maybe we'll have to get together. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan, Wendy. <laughs> yeah, uh, my boyfriend is a scratch golfer at he has at Oahu Country Club just up the street from you, TJ. Um, but yeah, I can't really play with him. So I need yeah. Plus I need that that course friends. it rains constantly at that course. Um, yeah. But uh, yes. Yeah, so I have a question. Any notions of reopening church, including the gallery? Um, the the notion that I perceive from the board is that they're sticking pretty close to July um, as the plan, partly because we had to plan like worship and all these things and we needed a date to work with, you know, like to, to make plans. And that was what was chosen. And it's turning out many of my colleagues thought of, we were nuts and turns out many of them are now, well, you were right. Um, Seeing the announcement today from uh, the administration that all adults who want one could have a vaccination by May might knock that up by a few weeks. But my sense is that it would make more sense to have a solid plan of say, say that happens, say in May everyone's vaccinated, to take a breath in June, you know, and, and to get everything set up. We got equipment we're going to have to buy things like that already for um, for doing different kinds of video stuff when we're live because we're still going to have a video um, component. Uh, so I could see July still being the time. And it would also give everyone a chance to get prepared. I mean, it's, it's already March, April, May, June. Like, you know, if we know that's the date, uh, then that would make sense to me. But ultimately, it is a board decision. So I'm kind of passing on half of the board's opinion and half of what I'm looking at from like a worship technical perspective. Um, but that is that is kind of where it looks like things are are going is, is July. Um, so I don't know if you saw like another state today decided no one has to wear masks anymore. And Texas. I don't know what is going to happen. Yes. It's like, I don't know what they're thinking. But when things like that start to happen and then things start to spike again, I just am really prayerful and hopeful that it doesn't spread. Um, so we shall see. But yeah, that's that's where we're at right now. But um, I've thought about going in more myself, just being in the office, because uh, and I have actually some Tuesdays I've I've worked from the church because of things going on with the banner and things like that. But um, but as far as like fully opening. Looks like July. So, yeah. Any other random questions about about such? Sure, Nancy, go ahead. Uh, how's the banner doing this week? Good question. We're on. <laughs> so now I should I keep a running list. I have a narrative of all the different things that happened with the banner. Technically, seven is back up. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know, on the 24th, it was spray painted again. So it made it almost almost oh. two weeks. Um, and so we put, I had already cleaned off seven. So I had that in my car. So eight was spray painted. So I took eight down, put seven up, and now eight is back in my trunk, all clean from the spray paint. So Right now, as far as I know, Seven is doing fine. Seven is Brandon's banner, Reverend Brandon, uh, that actually I wrote there, wrote a little blessing from Central Union onto the banner. Uh, so, and then eight is Reverend Matthewson's banner. <laughs> so uh, keep them informed of how their banners are doing and things like that. Um, so that's how- That could be your next book. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where things are going. It seems, it seems the assailant has um, gravitated now toward the um, spray painting, which I can deal with because it's just a little bit of goo gone and elbow grease and we have our banner back. And um, I don't love it. I'm sure you don't love that I'm spending two and a half hours dealing with a banner 
uh, clean up and things like that uh, on uh, given days. But that's just kind of where we're at with it. But better that than $125 per banner. So that's where we are right now. Uh, there's a question here about follow up on the perpetrators. I think there's only one perpetrator because in my, you know, I love Murder, She Wrote and I consider myself <laughs> modern day Jessica Fletcher. And um, I mean, she was a modern woman. There's no modern day. I mean, she was way ahead of her time. So I consider myself a contemporary of Jessica Fletcher. And I looked at the two videos side by side of the, the perpetrator who was filmed in broad daylight on MLK, on MLK Monday and then the one who came in the dead of the night with a mask on and a hat uh, covering. And I looked at their gait and height and everything side by side in slow motion. And, and I think he was not only wearing the same sandals, the same uh, Olukai sandals, but was moving in the same way. Oddly enough, the detective didn't care for my uh, Jessica Fletcher-esque antics in, in opining on my, my gait analysis of the assailant. <laughs> he did he did not uh he did not think that would carry the day in the court of law uh so right now what's happening is the good pictures we have of the broad daylight one uh they've been following up with the philippine embassy because they had um they had a lot of contractors on site that day and so they're trying to get a list of contractors and get the pictures out to them uh I don't know how motivated, honestly, I don't know how motivated police are to help someone with a Black Lives Matter ban. I, I, did, I did explain that both, and it is true that Takashi Ono and, um, and, spe specific, and especially Carl Rhodes are interested in hearing what's going on. Um, those are our Senator and our representative for the churches. And I did mention that to the officer and things started to move a little faster. Um, and I mentioned, you know, five other faith communities are curious, which is also true. Uh, so when he started to get the sense that we're talking about a thousand people who are wondering, not just, you know, a few hundred or a hundred, uh, things seem to be moving a little faster. So that's where we are with the perpetrators, so to speak. Um, we have another uh, question here or a comment. My acupuncture and best friend has had great success helping people get their sense of smell. Ah, interesting. Thank you. I will uh, maybe follow up with you, Wendy. I'm hearing that uh, looks like there's some ways of getting uh, smell back. And this friend is actually very attuned. He has an acupuncturist. So maybe I'll have to mention that to him. So uh, thank you. Carol's just putting her dessert right in front of everyone to have I to know. look at there. So <gasps> it's funny. Uh, you're, you're muted, Carol. What's that? <laughs> we, uh, we stopped on the way uh, to from Simple Joy. And we have um, wong tong noodle soup and pad thai and spring rolls. Very nice. So, mm. this, so this, is, this is dinner, not dessert yet. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a, some kind of uh parfait or something like that ah this is the, is the the wong tong soup i put it in a bowl got it. and then we're getting ready to chow down <laughs> so i i have it, it on mute okay good idea all right okay all right Tell them we are. all right all kinds of stuff yes allison question Um, you were saying that it takes about two hours for you to clean up the banner with the spray paint on it. Is that something that another committee could take care of? So, you know. Uh, it, it could. I mean, the involvement is, uh, you know, because so that's everything from clipping off the old uh, zip ties to getting the new zip ties to to folding the banner, to putting the new banner up and dealing with the bungee cords and the tent pegs. So it's been something that like Stuart and I have done partly out of our own ministry, you know, to the church. And um, it, it could, it could get someone involved. I mean, if, if as 
you know, say the vice president of the church were in this call, um, <laughs> <laughs> if they wanted to bring that up, you know, or, or if we wanted to have a discussion offline, I'm, I'm happy to turn it over. Part of it is I live, you know, two miles from the church and I can do it immediately. And, you know, Saturday, it was like, I was at a friend's house in Kahalu and it was kind of, we were leaving. I was like, well, I gotta go. I, someone's like, I gotta do this. I gotta do this. I'm like, I gotta hang the Black Lives Matter banner. And everyone just looks at me like, what is wrong with you? But um, that's just part of what happens. You know, I, I get it up and then I bring it back to my house and, and, you know, get it all cleaned up. So the answer is yes, a committee could do it, but I really like it done ASAP. And so the question would be, would a committee also like hop to it, get it all done, get it all up. And I'd be happy to turn it over if the committee would like to. Um, but I do think it's imperative that a, dis a deface sign doesn't stay up too long. So, yeah. So that would be that would be the deal breaker for me, is the ability to respond quickly and do it, get it done. So, yeah. So who calls you and lets you know it's been defaced? Vanessa, at the church. Oh, okay. Yeah, the tenant. Thanks uh -huh. for doing that. That's a yeah. real act of love. Yeah. Sometimes I put my collar on and do it just because people can see <laughs> that a minister is doing it, you know? Very good. Um, Ooh. Yeah. I mean, I, and I sing if I had a hammer and then realize I have a hammer and I'm hammering. Ten <laughs> um, but if I had a collar, <laughs> I had a collar. Yep. <laughs> so there's a whole, there's a whole song there. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Some days it's tougher than others. Some days are just it's just so mean, you know. But other days it's just like, all right, here's what we're doing. Um, but we haven't had to actually buy a new one in quite some time now. So I feel like we're making progress. But yeah. And there are days where I just get the feeling like it might happen that night and I want to kind of just go over and hang out. <laughs> but um, but we'll see. So come on in, Stuart. But uh I feel like this is Mr. TJ's neighborhood, and <laughs> it is. Now, friendly neighbor Stuart has come over to to say hi. Do you want to say hi to everyone? Hello, everybody. Hi. We're on a we're on a Reverend TJ AMA. Do you have a question? Uh, yes. TJ, as a Unitarian, how should I deal with difficult people? Ah, that's a good question. We have a whole religion for it. It's called. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, with compassion, justice, and joy is how, I mean, do you have a specific, a specific, I assume it's one of your colleagues in school. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm in a group project, like a lot of business school is all group projects, and I end up being the one that has to carry the entire group. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, it's just really difficult. It's like, you know, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make it drink. Nope. And so, you know, I end up being like, well, I'm just going to do it so I don't get an F. Yeah. So it's, it's a difficult situation, but yeah. This is really a question of ethics, Stuart. Okay. Um, this is not a setup, but like the question is, it's about a group. And do you want the group to succeed over, you know, this is a, it's, a, it's a Star Trek II ethics question. You know, do the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few? Uh, and in this case, like the needs of the many being the group to do well, does it outweigh, you know, the specific need you have to be right, you know, or, and if you're doing an unfair amount of work, does it, if you think it's really that unfair, is it, my question is always, are you really doing five times the amount of work or maybe twice the amount of work that you normally do to get your A? What do you think? Um, well, I don't want it to be too long of it. Yeah, discussion here, but it's yeah, it's more like four times. Uh, so here's here's where it comes down. Then I'd say that we used to play this in um in in divinity school. You know, there was the um the ethicist. He used to, it was in the New York in the New York Times uh, weekend uh, book. Chuck Fosterman was the ethicist, and we would play this game. We'd read the ethical problem, and then we'd all go around and say our solution, and we'd read the ethicist solution. So in this case, it would be a balance between what damage would be done by ratting out the non-working members uh, and just saying, 
uh, I've been doing all this work, they have done none, and perhaps giving them four Fs and you an A versus doing the work and making sure everyone gets the A. And you know, part of that is a question of what is the uh, school's policy on academic honesty and how closely you want to adhere to that. And the second is cultural norms of undergraduate school in Hawaii, which might be that you know, you kind of expect that some people are just going to phone it in and hope for the best. And you kind of have to strike your balance and make sure you're not violating anything you've signed or a contract that you've made uh, while also meeting your own needs. Hmm. So that would be my take. Okay. I know that's not satisfying. Well, you know. But your original question was, how do you deal with it? Yeah, it's more about how do I how do I deal with it emotionally, not right. so much like the utility of what do I do. So the way I deal with it is, it may not surprise anyone to learn. I I just would do all the work. So that's where I'm at. I think there's a lot of people on this call who are probably in that camp. And yeah, I actually would say, welcome home, Stuart, to Unitarian Universalism. You're among friends. <laughs> we are a church of people who would probably do that. And because that's just how we it's found the time our you do extra, eat a bowl of chocolate ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. then eat a bowl of chocolate ice cream. I can. I totally can do that. So I right. think the, the real trick is not being resentful right. about it. You have to find some place. I always hated group projects for exactly that reason it's like i'd way rather just do it myself i think that's why they give them to you is <laughs> you're supposed to learn how to deal with people and the fact of the matter is a great many of our interactions with each other leave us feeling frustrated and resentful um, yeah. in my universe <laughs> So, um, yeah, so how, TJ, there's the question. So well, how do you not, do how do you not be yeah. pissy about it? So I've, I've been cute up until now, but the minister answer is, I pray for each and every one of those people. When they make <laughs> me, it's true. When they make me resentful, I not only pray for them, but I pray that they get everything in the world that they could ever have wanted. You know, I, I pray for a world where there's enough, where there is no scarcity, where we all have what we need and where these people maybe are behaving out of some kind of loss or some kind of pain that creates this in other people's lives and that it be healed. And that may not be healed today, but it may be healed eventually. And, and being grateful, again, not to just be the minister, that I am part of a community that actually cares about that and would do that. And I, I'm most grateful for that. Yes. It'd be nice to be able to talk to these people too and, and let them know that you're upset and that you would really like them to help. Communication is not a bad plan too. That's Mary, so, Mary's shaking her head. It's really hard <laughs> to do that with uh, taps. Yeah. Uh, I should probably like, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll sit on that one. I'll think about it. <laughs> you can run a I mean, the praying for people thing though is you know the whole point of prayer is it changes oneself right yeah and and that that mm. the, the whole the goal here you're not going to change them the only thing you can change in the situation is not being pissy because the only thing that being pissy does is hurt you yeah right yeah, it, it doesn't make them do any more work it and it's completely even when it's so there's the whole justifiable anger you know what do you do with justifiable anger and it's like well you, you don't Same. have to deal with it so right well, word <laughs> forgiveness yep thank you so yeah totally <laughs> I, I have something. Um, Stuart, do you have to? Do you have the same group the whole time, or um, is it just for one project? No, it's the whole class. The uh, oh, so the the long version is that it's a 
marketing simulation and we have three products in three different regions we have to do pricing decisions ordering decisions research and development decisions advertising mm -hmm. decisions, budget decisions uh we've been bankrupt since the first decision we have 12 decisions two a week and uh if it's like i'm the only person that ends up making all of these decisions when it's like a lot to do because if I don't do it then nobody else does. And um when we like you know I try to like rally them together to like meet on Zoom and we do that and they pretty much have nothing to offer me. So I I kind of just like yeah all right well I guess I'm doing it. So uh mm. yeah I'll probably note that on like the group evaluation at the end of the course. But mm -hmm. it's still a situation where I'm going to end up having to do everything, um, which when I think about it is like, well, what would I rather do? Would I rather be in a group by myself or I end up doing everything anyway? You know, like if you, to me, it's like either way, I'm going to have to do the same amount of work. So mm -hmm. it just it is what it is. Uh, it's more about like my feelings about the injustice of it all so it's not it's fun <laughs> yeah. I'll it and, uh, it's over in two months and then i'm on to bigger and better things and i will pray that that this is that this remains the kind of injustice that you experience in your life i know ever. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> this is like problems. yeah and, and the scheme of like the totality of humanity, what humanity experiences, like, oh man, this is like nothing. Oh, oh. there you go. Look at that. You're like very privileged problems. Which is also a form of ethics of rationalizing like where other people are and where I am, you know, is a, is yeah. a branch of ethics. Absolutely. So that's yeah. good. <laughs> All right. I had um, a situation the last time I was in, I was teaching summer school, uh, U.S. history, and the, the students, they could divide in their own groups and all that. And after the end of the first project, I asked them if they wanted to fire some of the people off of their group. <laughs> and many of them did. And so then the ones that were fired, they, they came together and they really did very excellent work. After they were fired off of the original group, <laughs> and it was it was just hilarious to me. But the ones that were just kind of just there, they knew that they had to work because the other ones that were in their group, they were just okay. there on their group. <laughs> so it, it was quite quite interesting to to see the dynamics of that. One of my favorite college classes, the teacher divided us up. But she put the workers in one group and the non-workers in another and the it, mediocres in another. And that was one of my favorite memories of college because our group, I was so excited. We worked so hard together. And then some of the kids came in for the final presentation with absolutely nothing. <laughs> thought, Thank God I didn't get with them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was a teaching music class. Interesting. Well, good. <laughs> Uh, excellent. We covered a lot of, uh, of good ministerial work there with one of our, our members. Uh, I, have, I have one in the chat, but I see uh, a hand up. Nan, yes, question. So when you were in law school, did you also go through ethical kinds of stuff? And how would you as an attorney have suggested that Stuart start <laughs> to answer this problem? And this is, how have you changed? <laughs> Uh, or have you? So in law school, yeah, we went through ethical things. Um, there was always, in law school, it's all about outlines. It's all about who's taken the class before and made a good outline and can give it to you <laughs> so that you essentially don't have to go to class. Like, if you have a good enough outline, you never have to go to class because uh, nothing really changes. The casebook is the casebook. And so these could be even good for three, four, five years. And so there's a lot of ethics about like, if you're part of this group, like I was on a law journal. And so if you're getting these things through the law journal, they say they don't want you giving it to your study group because it's like, they're not really part of the, the group. 
So a lot of your first ethical stuff in law school, for me at least, was around good outlines for classes. And so you just kind of managed it. And it, a lot of it was here, I'm giving you this, but don't tell anyone. Um, and uh, because it got so much easier once you could email things. You're like, you know, I was, I was at law school at sort of the beginning of, well, now you people are emailing, but like really where everyone had a laptop in class was like when I was starting to go to law school. So everything was a lot simpler to share. So those were some of the ethical, there were other ethical things, but that was one of the, the big ones uh, for us. And uh, today, if someone wasn't doing their work, I think in law school, and now even as a lawyer, we would we would just I would have spoken up much faster, you know. I think I never would have let to not Stuart's not in the room anymore. He's talking to my friend Sean, uh, but I never would have let it get there. Uh, I I just I just speak up faster, you know, and and you know maybe it. But today it might mean like I'm I'm not doing this, you know. I might not do to get the A, you know, because I I realize also that it, that the grade maybe doesn't matter as much uh, as the process. And so I might have been more, uh, uh, more um, solicitous of help uh, earlier on. I think that's probably the difference. Uh, whereas as a lawyer, I, I really wouldn't have cared. It was all about getting whatever the best grade I could was. So at least in law school. So. In law school, blessedly, there are almost no group projects. Right, Allison? I mean, you don't, there's, it's all, you're all on your own. So, um, but the one group project I had they just, someone else, honestly, someone else just did it. So, cause it wasn't even a, but it wasn't even mad. It was like right in the area of what he did. And he's like, I literally have these on my computer, these samples, we don't have to make them up. He's like, so he didn't really do any extra work, but I do remember that Dave dies. Law, law school is a lot more competitive, a lot more cutthroat. Yeah. That, that whole look to your left, look to your right. One of you's not going to be here next year kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was a different, different thing. So I was kind of imagining it though in div school with like all the hurt feelings and all this stuff. Like if, if someone wasn't doing their work and like, I was just trying to, I was imagining all my friends from divinity school being like, are you, is it something I did? Was there something that you're mad about? Anyway, but, uh, which would have been really darling. Um, <laughs> I, I see another hand and I will get to you, Kimberly, but there is a question in the chat that I'm sure the person who asked it is wondering whether I'm just going to ignore it, but I'm not going to. Uh, it's what's your take on the telescopes on Mauna Kea? Um, well, the question is, is I, could, I could be very lawyerly and say, well, you're asking about the ones that are on Mauna Kea. Well, they're there already, but I think what you're asking is about building another one. Um, and, uh, you know, we looked at this two, two years ago was really the height of when this was happening. You know, it was around March and April, uh, two years ago. You know, Unitarian Universalists are in a, are in a, a space, you know, especially with our, um, our principles and our sources, you know, that tell us to be cautious of idolatries of the mind um, in together with uh, science and learning. Um, and they tell us to also to acknowledge the sacredness of the world's religion. So it really is one of the best examples of where uh, the rubber meets the road for uh, Unitarian Universalists. Um, so what this is, is what's your take on the telescopes? And the question I've asked myself often is what what horse do I have in this race, you know, as, as a white colonial settler from Darien, Connecticut, you know, who went to Yale, who was part of the, the history, the lineage of, of conqueror ministers on this island. It would be just really ethically hard for me to take a strong stand for continued encroachment on sacred land from my position. Um, it, I, I would have a really hard time doing it. Like I'm literally from Connecticut, like the place that birthed so much of the trauma that this land has, has endured. So that's my take is that I just don't think. And the other thing I often say is, you know, <laughs> UH doesn't need anyone to defend it. It's got law firms, big ones, 
It's got a ton of money. It's got a state. I, I should say it doesn't mean anyone. It doesn't need me. Certainly does not. I do not need to be on that side. Uh, they're they're going to do fine on their own, on their, their, their argument, their side of it. Um, so all that being said, uh, when the voices of indigenous people rise and coalesce around something, it is definitely my place to listen, to stay out of the way, you know, of expressions of pain, trauma, and belief, um, and to understand what is it that I really can conceivably do about it, um, and what can our church do about it, or and if doing doing something about it means, it seems right now our church is more or less at a detente, you know, where we're not really taking a stand one way or the other. The church isn't uh, for fear that it would tear a lot of uh, feelings, you know, and a lot of perhaps relationships even asunder. Um, so that's that's my take on where it is and and where it is in the church. Um, it's a divisive issue in the state, I know, but I hope I wasn't too circumspect uh, and gave you my honest kind of take on stuff. So, but you know, my my sister's a scientist. My dad's a scientist. You know, my mom's a teacher. I'm a minister. It's a it's an interesting house. Uh, so, yeah, Kimberly, you had your hand up. No big deal. No big deal? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we are at seven. Well, 6.59. But uh, <laughs> we've, uh, we've answered a lot of questions. Next week, Dennis Grau in concert. Yeah. So oh. we're going to have a little, a little Dennis Grau Hawaiian music uh, celebration. So uh, it should be fun. It's been a little while. So yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I hope uh, everyone has a wonderful week. Many blessings to everyone. And thank you for, for coming. <laughs>